Welcome to First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis, the birthplace of Congregational Humanism. We carry on that tradition of free thought today, dedicated to promoting a free search for truth, meaning, and justice. Our web address is firstunitarian.org. I'm David Breeden, Senior Minister. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly multimodal assembly for Sunday, February 27th, 2022. Whether this is one of your first visits or you've been with us many times, we are glad that you are here as a part of our gathered community. If you're online today, please make use of the chat feature to check in with each other. I see that's already happening. And for the, those of you in the building, uh, please join us downstairs in the lower assembly hall for coffee after the service. And for everyone, please make note that there is no online coffee hour today. As always, we hope that you will keep current with your Friday email from FUS. That's the place to find all the info about all the good things that are going on around here. And a uh, course, take a look at our snazzy new website. I promise that you'll learn something new. Our theme this month is widening the circle, and our opening words today are from our own Reverend Dr. David Breeden. Into the circle. We gather into this circle. We gather into this circle of care to dream, to envision, to embody and achieve the compassion we dream, the justice we envision, the dignity of each in an ever-growing circle of love and justice. Come, let us gather in community. Each week when we gather, we light our chalice and repeat one of our aspirations or some of the UUA principles. This week, I wanna read the one that we have just adopted last year. It's not actually yet a principle, but we hope it will be soon, and that's the eighth principle. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. Thank you, Paul. If you will join me behind those masks or at home in our congregational covenant. Love is the spirit of this place and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Hello, uh, welcome back to the building. I know I've met some of you, but I'm Ted Olson. I'm the new interim music director. And I'm really excited to have um, these two wonderful musicians here. Uh, we have Siri Undlin on guitar, vocals, Addie Stry on piano, woodwinds, and um, voice. And they play in a band called Humbird, which is about to go on tour. So it was really nice to get them in here um, before they left. Really liked Siri's songwriting for a long time. And we've only had the chance to play like one Irish song in a group of like 10 musicians. So this is really a, a treat. This first song is called Pink Moon for John Prime. Patience is a spell to cast. Mine never seems to last longer than a Midwest sunset wrapping around this city. 
I'm walking through a purple dusk Trying to clear the cobwebs and the dust of my own mind God, I must have slipped into a slow rust The pink moon rising to the east Today I was not as kind as I set out to be friend is on the other line. She called to talk instead we cry. The pandemic hit. Her father died. Says the greatest gift she got was time. It's so hard to breathe with a tight chest. While gratitude makes dinner taste the best. I'm making new meals out of leftover food so I can sit at the table and stare at you. Music director search team needs your input. Now follow the bouncing QR code, which we didn't get up here because it uh, wouldn't it freaked out the computer somehow or other. But we can get you that information. Uh, whoops. Uh oh. There we go. Thank you. And we do have a, a brief survey. If you haven't done that. Definitely see uh, it soon if you have lost that somehow. And sometimes the one, the uh, the emails that come from specifically mem for members do go into spam folders uh, because we do send out to around 500 people. So there's some confusion sometimes on that. So if you didn't get the music survey, email me minister at firstunitarian.org. Uh, the email came last Tuesday, and you can look back in, in, in your spam folder if you think you didn't get that. The survey will be open until Tuesday, March the 1st, which is not long from now because remember, February is short, all right? And so don't delay, get your voice into the mix as we consider where we're going with music next year. Thank you. Save the date, Saturday, March the 26th, for the FUS annual auction. 5.30 happy hour with live music, and then the auction at 6.30. To see details, click either annual auction tab on the FUS website. On the annual auction page, you'll want to take a quick look at the Together Auction website instructions. Click Register to get to the Together Auction website. You can browse the catalog of items for sale whether or not you're logged in. Make your donation on the Together Auction website or fill out a donation form available at FUS on Sundays. What should you donate? Well, use your imagination. How about a leisurely boat ride, a picnic for a group, a weekend at your cabin, or unused gift certificates? 
It'll be both online and in person, so join us no matter where you are. You may purchase your tickets for the happy hour on the Catalog of Items page or at FUS on Sundays. It will feature live music, beverages, and hors d'oeuvres. The live auction will again feature our auctioneer, Colonel Kurt Johnson. So save the date, Saturday, March the 26th. Don't miss it. All right. It's a good thing that I started life as a disc jockey in this new uh, post-COVID world anyway, so <laughs> I can kind of get through 45 seconds without stumbling at this point. Your pledge form return to us ensures sunshine for sailing in the next fiscal year. That's what our stewardship uh, team says. We have more than 25%, and actually since they wrote this, it's uh, going closer to 50% of pledges returned, and members are really stepping up. Please send in your pledges this week if you haven't done so already. Here's your final video from the stewardship team as we begin wrapping up the smooth sailing stewardship campaign. We are in smooth sailing mode. Life is good. You're getting your pledges returned. Members are really stepping up. The skies are blue and the forecast is clear. As Ted Lasso would say, I feel like we fell out of the lucky tree and hit every branch on the way down, ended up in a pool of cash and sour patch kids. Thanks to everyone who has contributed so far. We really appreciate the sunshine you bring to our sailing journey. All right. <laughs> well, we aren't passing the basket due to COVID, uh, but, and we haven't been doing that for, oh, it's going to be 24 months pretty soon, as you know, but that doesn't mean that we don't need your help to keep our programs running. The easiest way to give is to go to our website, firstunitarian.org, and click on the Give link at the upper right corner. You can also give on PayPal and the Venko mobile app if you're a smartphone user, or you can send a check. And thank you for making the work of First Unitarian Society possible. Okay. <laughs> on Sundays when we gather, we take a few moments to reflect on the joys and the sorrows and milestones of the human experience. We do this so that we stay in touch with our own humanity. We do this to remind ourselves of the value of moments of stillness and we do this so that no one among us is alone, either in celebrating joy or in facing the burdens of life. This morning, we have some news from FUS member Becca Justiano, who many of you know as is one of our sign language interpreters on Sunday mornings. A week ago, Becca had emergency gallbladder surgery, and she's spent the past several days recovering at home. She says the pain continues to decrease, and she's grateful for the messages of support she has received. We send along our good wishes to Becca for her continued improvement. And if you would like to contact her or reach out to her, email or contact Reverend Jim. Today we are mindful of the human suffering caused by war. International law has long been ignored by powerful nations attacking weaker nations. And the Charter of the United Nations has often been ignored, yet we must continue to insist that international disputes be resolved through diplomacy and that international borders be changed only by consent of the people affected. The European order, established in 75 years ago out of the ashes of a war after the deaths of hundreds of millions of people has been badly and dangerously damaged this week. May the outrage of the world awaken even the most cynical of our world leaders. Today, we also mourn for and are outraged by the cynical and oppressive acts of the Texas governor and the Texas attorney general, who have declared that, quote, a number of sex change procedures constitute child abuse under existing Texas law, end quote. This attack on the vulnerable through the coercion of mandatory reporters of child abuse, such as teachers, counselors, clergy, and others, is the most heinous sort of religiously motivated hate. 
We now take a few moments to reflect on the violence and oppression in our world and on those who seek to comfort the suffering and to work for justice. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out to admit what you want from the moment so keep going kid the world may not have noticed yet but I did Charlotte it's been a hard month the noises in the night we all slept rough Charlotte it's beautiful, isn't it? The moon on the rooftops, the silver light drips. Sweet dreams, kid. I hope you find some peace while you're sleeping. is a reading from Isabel Wilkerson in her wonderful book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. She writes, 
We in the developed world, we in the developed world are like homeowners who inherited a house on a piece of land that is beautiful on the outside, but whose soil is unstable loam and rock, heaving and contracting over generations. Cracks patched, but the deeper ruptures waved away for decades, centuries even. Many people may rightly say, I had nothing to do with how all of this started. I have nothing to do with the sins of the past. My ancestors never attacked indigenous people, never owned slaves. And yes, not one of us was here when this house was built. Our immediate ancestors may have had nothing to do with it, but here we are, the current occupants of a property with stress cracks and bowed walls and fissures built into the foundation. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect the uneven pillars or joists, but they are ours to deal with now. And any further deterioration is in fact on our hands. Like other old houses, America has an unseen skeleton, a caste system that is central to its operation, as are the studs and joists that we cannot see in the physical buildings we call home. Caste is the infrastructure of our divisions. It is the architecture of human hierarchy, the subconscious code of instructions for maintaining, in our case, a 400-year-old social order. Looking at caste is like holding the country's x-ray up to the light." Close quote. Congregations and larger associations are like that old house. As Paula jo Cole Jones reminds us, we are communities of communities, both within and beyond our walls. We've gotten a report on this old house from an inspector. At the Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly in New Orleans in 2017, the Commission on Institutional Change was convened and charged with conducting an audit of the power structures and, and an analysis of systemic racism and white supremacy culture within the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association. At First Unitarian Society, we are a member congregation of the UUA, and some of us consider ourselves only tangentially connected to the larger association because of our explicit humanism. Even so, this final report of the commission has much to teach us about how we have real room for improvement in our expressions of hospitality and welcome, our commitment to deepen our spiritual practices, including the practice of justice making, and the ways we care for each other. Today, Reverend David and I will share some ideas about widening the circle of concern from the inside out. The report, the report on the Commission for Institutional Change, the report is called Widening the Circle of Concern, centers the voices of those that have been silenced or drowned out and it illuminates places where elitist or exclusionary white privilege inhibits connection and creativity. It asks white people to do the interior and structural work of dismantling white supremacy culture within themselves and their institutions. The report says this, just as we can understand that the current paradigm of white dominance centers white identity and the comfort of white identified people, we can also understand that a more just and effective system would center the comfort, safety, growth, agency, and capacity for self-realization of those who are currently most oppressed. This change in centering would have a benefit for all. 
So here's a story from the before times, the before COVID times. Imagine you are a young black person who has come to FUS for the second or third time. Imagine that you now see some familiar faces and, and you greet people and they greet you back. You go down to the lower assembly hall for a mini meal and there you are having a conversation with a couple of white folks about whatever. Another white FUS member joins your group because she needs to talk to one of the participants. She enters and dominates the conversation. And when you, the black person, the black newcomer says something about your own experience, whatever it is, this new voice contradicts you about your own experience. You have just learned as a black newcomer to the congregation to keep your mouth shut here because your own experience has just been invalidated. At least three expressions of white supremacy culture happened in this scenario. A white person butting into an existing conversation because her need superseded the relationship building that was taking place, dismissing the lived experience of a black person, and the missed opportunity for other white conversation partners to interrupt this microaggression, either by telling the white interloper to wait or by turning to the black participant and asking for more information about their experience. These microaggressions happen quickly and they are most likely forgotten by the white participants there, but not by the black participant. The black person decided that this place talks more about a radical welcome than practicing it and they haven't been back. That's a true story. When I investigate this story for myself, I am well aware that that interloper could have been me. I am quite certain that I have behaved with no bad intention in all of those ways. Please understand the white folks in the story are not bad people, but without a way to interrogate their actions, they may continue the microaggressions while at the same time asking why we don't have more members of color. This is an example of failure to do the needed repairs on our house, to add stress to the foundation, to heap more burden on future occupants. And we are each of us responsible. I tell you, it is not a burden to consistently mine my interactions for places where white supremacy culture has its hooks in me. In fact, it is liberatory. We assert a humanist theology that human beings can solve human problems. Just like the residents of the old house, each of us has an obligation to interrogate our place in the structures of white supremacy culture, not because we are bad or ill-intentioned or as some of those folks who don't want any uh, uh, critical race theory to be taught because we'll feel badly about ourselves, but because all liberation is tied up together. And because white people need to be liberated from the burdens of white supremacy culture as much as the rest of the world does. This is the work that we can do in our congregation together, where we can hold each other accountable, where we can increase our tolerance for discomfort, where we can practice here the world we want to see outside. Try to remember back to your first experiences at First Unitarian Society. It may have been many months ago or years ago, or it may be today. What I want to know is how is your life different because of your connection to this community? To what extent has it deepened your humility, softened your humanity, widened your hospitality? How are you changed by what you've started here? This is a question we ask in our Pathway to Membership session. 
How do you imagine that your participation in FUS will change you in the coming decade? And we also ask folks to imagine that their how their commitment to this congregation will change FUS. Because each of us has the power and the possibility to shape change in the communities of which we are a part. Here we invite each other to be our best selves through work on governance, welcome teams, advocacy, justice work. Here we make art and music. We teach our young ones. We care for those who are ailing. Let us always do this with a mind to how we can make our welcome more inclusive, how much we are willing to be changed by the people that we invite into this space, and how liberation for all humankind is our mission and our goal. Let us not be just responsible owners of the house, but responsible and responsive and accountable residents. Let us continue to take on the needed repairs with full and humble hearts that we are ready for whomever may come through our door to be a part of our space. May it be so. Last week, I considered the data storm that we're living in nowadays and some ways to at least acquire a mental, spiritual umbrella in the storm. The wisdom of the ages, from Taoism to Hinduism to Buddhism to Stoicism to Christianity to New Ageism, for that matter, is somehow to be beyond or above the fray. Disconnection is, of course, good for the blood pressure. But what we do with wars and rumors of wars matter as well. What about inequality and climate change? We all know the old adage, no decision is a decision. Sitting back mindfully is making a decision to do nothing for the larger world. But we also do well to remember another adage, all politics is local. What I want to consider today is at first glance the opposite of mindfulness and disengagement, but actually I would argue they are all of a piece. All politics is local, implies engagement at the foundational, fundamental level. Seeing how the sausage is made is another of those old adages. For example, if you want to change First Unitarian Society for the better, get on the committees and the task forces. You want to change the city? Start knocking on doors, because all politics is local and our efforts at justice making, FUS focuses on the local as well. We are fortunate here in Minneapolis to have a strong and active group of downtown senior clergy. The FUS is one of the smaller congregations involved in that effort. When we join with the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Congregationalists, the Lutherans, the United Methodists, the Baptists, the Roman Catholics, Reformed Jews, Muslims, and so on, we cover a lot of ground around the city. 
We join with institutions that have much deeper pockets than we do. And we join in with a group not only with moral authority in the minds of many, but also with money and connections and numbers. We meet the mayor, we meet the city council members, we meet with the police, we meet with state officials, we meet with politicians and directors of nonprofits. They don't necessarily listen, but they hear what we are saying. My joining with other clergy aggregates our voices. As I often say, I see congregations as an aggregator. Each of us brings our individual social justice passions into the congregation, and the congregation aggregates our voices. And the downtown senior clergy group will do that as well. And for the first time in a long time today, when you go downstairs, you will have a chance to do something because our Active Voices group is back downstairs. Yay, and that's all politics is local. First Unitarian Society also joins the larger Unitarian Universalist Association and also the humanist and, humanist and congregational humanist movements. The UU Humanist Association reaches out and provides support for many humanists who attend UU congregations. Many of those congregations hostile to humanism. We also join with the Ethical Culture Movement, another humanist organization, and with the American Humanist Association, both the national and local level, and with lots of other secular groups, both nationally and locally. There are too many things to mention, but let me give you one example. So one of the things I do is chair the Education Committee of the American Humanist Association. The AHA has been working with United Theological Seminary in St. Paul to develop a humanism concentration in their master's program. The online program will help us train humanist leaders, humanist celebrants, and especially humanist chaplains that are much in need nowadays. The world is ready for secular humanism and congregational humanism. We need leaders, and we especially need leaders who look like the America of the future. There's nothing I like more in my work as a seminary professor than training young humanist leaders, especially young humanist leaders of color. They are the future, and they are here now, ready to change the world but their paths are often blocked by white Euro-American assumptions. You would be surprised how many UU and Humanist Association things are still the good old boys in the back room. That's what has to stop. As I've said many times, I am driven by a desire to leave the world better than I found it. I was born into a world dominated by wealthy, cisgender, straight white men. And my goal is to turn off the lights and lock the door on that world. I work for an America in which character is the defining aspect of every person. No judgment, Texas. As I grow older, I often think of the lines of William Butler Yeats in his poem, Sailing to Byzantium. It goes a little bit like this. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress, nor is there singing school. Now, I try to clap my hands and sing and louder sing for the future of humanism, free thought, and secularism. That's my local politics. Nor is there singing school, Yeats wrote, because the old, like me, cannot be taught the future. We're not going to be going to school in the future, but we can use our accumulated wisdom to sing another reality into being. All Unitarian Universalists need to take seriously and understand the report on the UUA Commission on Institutional Change that appeared in 2020 called Widening the Circle of Concern. It's available online, Rep. Kelly mentioned it a bit ago. Their guiding principle was this, 
quote, to keep Unitarian Universalism alive, we must privilege the voices that have been silenced or drowned out and dismantle elitist and exclusionary white privilege, which inhibits connection and creativity. Right, which inhibits connection and creativity. And that's important, that's what Rev. Kelly was talking about. And remember that sing and louder sing thing. We have to sing a song that exposes elitist and exclusionary white privilege for the hogwash that it is. The report also says, quote, amidst the diversity of the theologies represented in our congregations, justice work has been a proxy for what we believe in some congregations, while in other congregations, engagement with the intellect, debate, and social ties have been the substitute. Our justice work without theological resources and spiritual practices leads us down the path to burnout, end quote. Now the commissioners are being really nice and polite in that little quote. What they mean is that many congregations have made a religion out of progressive democratic politics. And a lot of congregations spend their time debating things rather than getting their shoes and their hands dirty out in the street and the government center and the state capitol. Under takeaways, the report says this, quote, these times require a liberatory faith that invites us each into the spiritual work of empathy and healing. Justice making is not a substitute for a coherent theology and faithful justice making requires a liberatory theology. A greater emphasis on the theological basis of our, for our work, for diversity, equity, and inclusion will help us to make decisions about the forms of this work most appropriate for our individual and shared lives." End quote. I agree with the commissioners that these are vital points if Unitarian Universalism is to survive and thrive. Because frankly, if we don't change things, there's no reason for Unitarian Universalism to survive and thrive. And I think that all social indicators point toward a non-theistic, maybe agnostic, secular theology. Unitarian Universalist minister and theologian and a UU humanist, William R. Jones, insisted in his groundbreaking book, Is God a White Racist? that the theism-atheism divide is always beside the point. The truer distinction is what he called, in theology speak, the functional ultimacy of the human being. Uh, the, the functional ultimacy of the human being, by which in English, Dr. Jones was uh, anticipating one of those things from the commission's report, quote, develop more theological resources to center our justice work in our faith, and make clear the interconnection between action in the world and spiritual development." End quote. They're not mutually exclusive. Remember, that's the point I made when I started living mindfully in the here and now and working for justice are not incompatible attitudes. Rather, they are essential companions in finding a purposeful life. I'm convinced that there is a moral force to free thinking a moral force that burns away creeds and dogmas and gets at the essence of human religious thinking. When the human moral imagination is loosed from the bonds of traditions and conventions and dogmas and creeds, it's a wondrous and powerful thing, unlike the religion of some Texas politicians. <laughs> Getting loose is essential for some of us. And staying loose also matters. The Atlantic Monthly columnist Arthur C. Brooks, in an article titled, The Meaning of Life is Surprisingly Simple, says this, quote, people who believe that they know their life's meaning enjoy greater well-being than those who don't. One 2019 study found that agreeing with the statement, quote, I have a philosophy of life that helps me understand who I am, end quote, was associated with fewer symptoms of depression and higher positive affect. You look happier, in other words. So, fewer symptoms of depression, higher positive affect, 
and are the results of saying, I know what my philosophy is. I have a moral code and I examine it and pursue both meaning and justice. When our theological anchors are all about liberation for all, through thinking freely, outside the traditional boxes, they are about serving the common good. I say this over and over again, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We are social animals. And those are pro-social behaviors, and they in no way require a theist orientation. That's why we call it humanism. As Reverend Dr. William R. Jones pointed out, it's not about believing in one God or another. It's about knowing that human beings can fix human problems. That's functional ultimacy. First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis is the core of humanism in the United States. We have been since 1916, and we will continue to be as long as the people of FUS want it. We, together, can widen the circle far beyond the Midwest and far beyond whiteness and just far beyond, period. I'm only one blip on the screen of FUS ministers carrying the saving message of humanism through time, but for me anyway, I will continue to follow William Butler Yeats's advice. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Thank you. If you will join me behind those masks in the extinguishing the chalice words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. All of these we carry in our hearts and in our minds until we are together again.
it's burning hot the flicker comes and goes it's all we've got come on home bring the heavy Thanks, Ted, and thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much. Our closing words are by Maya Angelou. Her poem, Continue. My wish for you is that you continue, continue to be who and how you are, to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. Continue to dare, to love deeply and risk everything for the good thing. Continue to float happily in the sea of infinite substance which set aside riches for you before you had a name. Continue, so may it be. <laughs>